Dr. T. Murrow by Paul John Lim, part three. Last time we left Constance and Theo deciding what was the best thing to do with the device, whether to destroy it or whether to dare to use it. We wondered what manner of contrivance this could be. We'd never seen anything like it. Could it all be real and not some illusion? Constance felt there was only one way to discover the truth of it. We had best read the documents and try to understand the plans and the instructions. We both read and reread the documents and tried to understand the wording and the terminology. None of it seemed to make any sense to us. There were three plans, drawn on a thin paper-like material. They showed extensive detailed component parts, most of which again were a total mystery to us. We decided the best course of action was to write to some eminent scientist friends of ours, without giving anything away. We asked about travelling through the ether, but correspondence returns showed little new information being imparted. We decided to try to reset the various knobs and so on to be as the instructions had directed. Two parts seemed to have separated, and we bound them together with bandages soaked in gum arabic solution. A dial on the top was hanging unconnected by a glass-like tube of glass-like filaments. It was flexible. At the end it had a plug of some description, and I placed it within a similar shaped socket on the device. It went home with a click. One month after that time, we followed the drawings and instructions and set the cylindrical clock rollers and the date to an hour before the present time. Assured we had restored the device to a working order, we switched on the machine and nothing happened. Once more we checked against the instructions and still nothing occurred. Into that night we scoured the documents and tried once more and again and again and the device sat in silence. Constance retired to bed. I slept in the chair and I woke up the following morning First thing I did was to try again, but still the machine was inert. Then, as if fate was interceding, we had a breakthrough. By accident, I had left the main power switch in the on position. I sat again looking at anything I'd missed. At that point, Constance entered the room with the traveller's watch-type object and was just about to speak when a whirring set off, a low hum, and the machine was alive once more. I decided it must only work when this object was in close proximity. I motioned Constance to leave the room, and the machine again powered down. We had the key now that caused the machine to function, and felt ready to try it out in earnest. 
I chose to go alone, and after a slight difference of opinion, Constance eventually agreed to stay. I gave her a parting kiss, promising I would return, and again she begged to come along. But after much persuasion, I sat alone on the seat in readiness. I waved her and pressed the controls after the instructions. With a great ado, the room vibrated, and a terrific noise, the likes I had only ever heard once before when the traveller had arrived. I felt dizzy as the ether sped past me, and I had to hold on tight so as not to be dislodged. In a halo of green haze, I finally arrived at Morrow Hall, just as the clock chimed, exactly three hours earlier than before I had left. I felt violently sick and shaking. Then after composing myself, I sat looking around for a few minutes. Then with great noise and sound once more, I again returned back to Morrow Hall. Once again, the journey was far from a pleasant experience. This time something had changed. Some action had caused an interaction. And now all the pieces of equipment had appeared on the floor, somehow avoiding the furniture. These objects were now connected to the device. It was at this point that Constance suggested that as our lives may depend upon it, we needed to know more about time itself. That evening Constance and I sat in the two chairs in the study facing the fireplace. Both of us lost in thought, mesmerised by the embers glowing in the grate. Constance suddenly broke the silence. I think we need to travel into the future, for surely the answer is to be found there. And there is no debate. This time I am travelling with you. I'd had a whisky, and I reluctantly agreed, but suggested we only travel a decade, so at least the world would be familiar to us. If all went wrong, and we were unexpectedly stuck there in the future time, then we would still have a home and a place to fit into. Constance added, Yes. I will tell everyone we are going away for a few months on a grand tour of the world. I've always wanted to do that. I replied, what a splendid plan. We will instruct Carter to cancel any deliveries other than for his own consumption. I am pleased now that we have not found a replacement servant girl after the last one ran away with the butler. We will tell him under no circumstance is he to enter Morrow Hall whilst we are away. Constance, ever the practical one, added, I will water all the palms. This time of year they don't need much water. All the rest we will move into the glass house for Carter to look after. We will pay him three months' wages in advance. I added, We will be away a very short time, as we can select what date we wish to return. Let's say three months from now, provided the machine functions correctly. Constance looked worried and then said, Thea, we really don't know enough. Are you sure we will be safe? I, whilst crossing my fingers behind my back, said, I am sure it will be a wondrous opportunity, a true adventure, one I would sorely regret, should we choose not to try? Constance, hands on her hips, scolded me, saying, Theo, I can see you are doing that finger-crossing thing, the same thing you do when you go to see your friends, promising not to drink too much port. You know me too well, I replied, and said we'd best retire, and leave first thing, taking a very light breakfast beforehand. After instructing Carter in the morning, we both dressed in our Sunday best, and I straddled the device. Constance joined me behind, side-saddle. I turned the controls, and the sounds as before began along with the unpleasant, dizzy, noisy sensation. After a hellish journey, which seemed to take far longer than I remembered, we arrived in the future. The room once again appeared in waves of transparency, and the device stopped. I felt quite ill and slowly composed myself. Constance, on the other hand, had taken it all in a stride, leaving her just slightly dizzy. In fact, she exclaimed how thrilling the experience was. Then we became aware of the smell, of damp, and of decay. I saw there was mould on one of the walls, and the palms were now a mass of desiccated sticks across the floor. Everywhere the dust sheets that covered the furniture were covered in a thick layer of dust, and plaster from the ceiling which had partly collapsed. In the ceiling was a jagged hole, exposing rotten beams. Cobwebs hung from the bedraggled curtains. The room was silent, other than the flapping of a bird somewhere above us. The clock had stopped. Constance was now in shock, and instead of comforting her, I dashed down the hallway and attempted to go outside. After shoving the door, I had to resort to giving it a good hard kick. This loosened the catch, and I had to push hard against the partially ceased hinges to get outside. I searched and shouted, but Carter was nowhere to be found. Behind the house, the lawn was waist-high, with small trees growing here and there. Everywhere there were signs of neglect. Looking up, I could see that at some point the eastern chimney stack had collapsed, partly into the roof, and presumably the remainder of the bricks lay buried beneath the tall grass. Below, a black line snaked down the roof, 
perhaps from a lightning bolt. I walked to the gardener's cottage, which seemed still in a good state of repair, despite the small overgrown lawn and overgrown back garden. We'd not really thought all this through, I thought. I returned to Constance, who had already forced open the French doors and had thrown out the dust sheets. She saw me and asked why this had all happened. We were only supposed to be away a short time. I bit my lip and shook my head from side to side as I advanced around. Constance, as ever, quickly took matters in hand and said she would carry on tidying up as best she could, then suggested I'd best go into town with the money we had bought with us to arrange for some food and provisions to be delivered. Most importantly, to buy some newspapers, so we can see if we are indeed ten years into the future.
I set off up the lane at an urgent pace, up the driveway into town. Many thoughts passed through my mind as I strode forth with urgency. I will need to get a tradesman to look at the roof and chimney stack first, with many other immediate practical plans filling in my mind. Not for one moment had I stopped to celebrate the fact that we were still sound in body and mind, and if the state of everything was an indication, we must be in the future. As I neared the end of the drive, I saw the entrance gates partially fallen, one resting on the other. More alarming as I neared were the sounds. The visage that met my eyes shocked me, as now buildings stood adjacent to the drive, and as I pushed my way past the tumbled left gate, I saw tracks of metal and horse-drawn trams passing each other on Main Street. As I crossed the road, a very old man shouted to me, but as I did not know him, I hurried my pace. After crossing the street, I was aware the tobacconist was now gone, and was now decorated with jugs of flowers, both inside and out. A pretty girl was arranging flowers inside the florist. I continued, and was well aware that the old fellow was still following me. I quickly turned down Christian's Passage, a shortcut to King Street. At the end facing me was a new-looking shop. A man on a stepladder was painting the sign above, and had got so far as the first few letters. As I went to go inside, I looked up and saw the familiar name of Andrew Butt's proprietor, written on a sign. Mr Butt looked at me, his head to one side, then said, that I looked like a customer he hadn't seen in a long time. He went on saying, surely you must be the brother of Mr Morrow. You look just like him. I smiled and said that no, I was indeed Theodore Morrow, and that I and Constance had been away on a grand tour, which unexpectedly took a while longer than we'd planned. He said, travelling must be good for your health. You haven't aged a bit. Usual, is it? A tin of golden cornfield brand finest oriental snuff? I thanked him and paid him. He said, I'm afraid it's gone up a bit since I last saw you. I gave him the rest. I then said, I've been looking for Carter. His face became more serious. Carter, after one year, had decided you must have been murdered or something. He lived in a shed behind the vicar's house and did odd jobs, mended shoes, etc. for a couple of years. Then he decided to go back to where he'd lived before and he moved back in with his sister. I replied, oh dear, the poor fellow. And suddenly the doorbell announced another customer. It was the old man. Is that you, Dr Morrow? It was then that I saw a glint in the eye of a man who had not fared well in ten years. Goodness, I exclaimed, if it isn't Godfrey Knighton. He replied, indeed it is. I missed so our games of chess. I added, and the port that went along with it. I grasped his hands and a tear formed in his eyes. Are you back for good now? And how's that beautiful wife of yours? She is radiant, I replied. I will be here for a while until the travel bug gets us once again. Well, don't be a waste long this time, else I'll be a dead un when you get back. He gave a chesty laugh followed by a raspy cough. I made my excuses that I needed to catch the grocer, Mr. Cousins. He's long gone, Mr. Butts replied. His own lorry ran backwards and squashed him, next to Betty May's tea shop, when it was full of customers. Tragic affair it was. His son drives lorry now, and his missus runs the business. Same lorry, though. Somehow keeps it going. Says it makes him think of his dad. Before I left, I purchased some newspapers and said goodbye to my friends, and said I'd see them soon. I walked along the street and then stopped. I took one of the newspapers and opened up the front page. The year was now exactly ten years after the date we had left Morrow Hall. The year was now 1892. We were in the future.